going to have our presentation by Ed Stockman on glyphosate and wetlands, invasive species management and control. Um, Ed is going to make his presentation first. Then we will entertain comments or questions, but not arguments. Um, Commissioner first. Commissioner will go first, but let, let's first hear our presentation, and then we'll go from there. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I've got something going on. I don't know if it's a cold or an allergy, but uh, my ears are clogged up, and uh, hopefully you can hear me yes. uh, well enough. But uh, uh, when you ask me questions, please speak up, and I'll ask you to repeat if I can't hear it. But uh, my name is Ed Stockman. Um, I had a consulting business. 85% of my business was in Berkshire County. I know Great Barrington pretty well. Um, I've done a lot of work here in the past, but I haven't consulted in probably 10 years or so. Uh, I tailored this talk to invasive plants uh, because that's what I thought we wanted to be talking about. Uh, I like to talk about glyphosate in agriculture. I like to talk about it in, in relationship to uh, landscaping. But um, I think we're going to primarily stick to invasive plants until the Q&A, then you can ask me anything you want. So we're going to do, uh, I was thinking about talking about glyphosate pros and cons, and here's some of the pros. Now, this, this came right off the top of my head. Uh, you know it's a broad spectrum uh, plant and micro killer. When I say broad spectrum, it means it kills a wide variety of uh, plants, both uh, grass type plants and broad leaf plants, and of course, it's, a, it, it's also um, uh, a killer or controller of microbes. It's very effective, except for resistant plants. There's 13 um, weeds now that are resistant to glyphosate that you can spray and it really doesn't uh, impact them. So every year there's more and more plants uh, becoming resistant, but it's still uh, pretty effective. It's easy to use. You just pour uh, concentrations in a sprayer and go out and spray it. In the short run, it's relatively inexpensive. Uh, I'm not sure about the long run, we'll talk about that. It's relatively fast acting, relatively speaking. Uh, you don't need much knowledge or training to be able to apply it. You might need a permit from the state to be a, a, a certified applicator, but you don't really need uh, a <coughs> training to actually go out and do the spraying. And Monsanto and Bayer, uh, you know that Monsanto has been purchased by Bayer, and uh, they now own the company, and Monsanto and Bayer, and the EPA says it's safe. Let's take a look at the safety. Monsanto in its past told us that DDT, PCBs, and Agent Orange were safe. And this is just another uh, one of their agrochemicals or chemicals down the line that they uh, have determined that it's safe. Now the EPA is an interesting agency nowadays. If you follow the, the news at all, you know that Trump's EPA, and I consider it a captive uh, agency, is dysfunctional at very best, and when it comes to pesticides, is non-functional. What I mean by a captive agency is they've been captive, uh, captured by um, agrochemicals, uh, agribusiness, uh, industrial agriculture, pharmaceuticals, uh, energy companies. Uh, they in my opinion now, and, and what I see and read, uh, they're really not concerned about the environment when it comes to uh, us, uh, the individual citizen in, in, in the United States. Trump's administration said that they have Monsanto's back. They've made that statement. Whatever Monsanto does, they're going to help them. So who do we trust? Who do we believe? This is a big problem today. Uh, 
who to believe is a difficult question, and it's um, it's very time consuming. There's a lot of talk about faith this and faith that, and uh, and uh, you know, as far as uh, who you can believe and who you can't believe. I like independent researchers. Oftentimes, they're not getting money from uh, a corporation. Corporate science, I have a great deal of difficulty with it now. I read a lot of science. I read a lot of research. As a matter of fact, I've given Shep some uh, pertinent uh, research uh, studies that the commission can uh, look at, and uh, uh, I'm giving you the, uh, the internet sites for it, and, and you can take a look at some of that. You don't have to read the whole research, just read the abstract, the synopsis of the research. The corporate science is a real problem. Corporations like Monsanto, they, um, they actually pay for the research, they control the research, they uh, determine the methodology of the research, they redact anything that's not flattering to their products. Uh, it's a very difficult thing today to know uh, which corporate science is, is good science and which is not good science. And our government agencies, very disappointed in them. And all you have to do is follow the news and you'd be disappointed too. The FDA, the EPA, the USDA, these are agencies that deal with glyphosate and pesticides. Uh, they don't seem to be interested in us at all these days. So let's take a look at some of the characteristics of glyphosate. Probably some of these you know about, some you don't. Broad spectrum herbicide we've talked about. A systemic pesticide. This word pesticide covers a whole array of chemicals that are used to control pests. Weeds are pests. Herbicides are pests, pesticides. Bactericides, fungicides, uh, these are all uh, types of pesticides. Systemic pesticide. A systemic pesticide is something that when you spray it on a plant, it's taken into the plant. It's incorporated in the, the tissues of the plant. It's not on the surface. You know, we all know about uh, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. The pesticides she dealt with back in the late 50s and early 60s were topical. These are pesticides that are on a plant. They can wash off. You could wash them off or wash some of it off. You cannot wash off systemic pesticides. So if it's on something that something is going to eat, whether it's wildlife or humans or an insect, it's going to impact that insect or that life form because the chemical itself is in the plant. It's part of the systems of the plant. And that's what makes these so different and so deadly compared to the older pesticides that uh, Rachel Carson dealt with. It's water soluble. Actually, it's very water soluble. It dissolves very readily in water. It adheres to soil particles, so it attaches itself to soil particles. It's a chelating agent. We're going to talk more about those as we go along. It's uh, antimicrobial. It's non-toxic to mammals. And this is the justification for its non-toxicity. Uh, for many years, we've been told by Monsanto and our federal agencies that this is pretty much a harmless substance because it's non-toxic to mammals. But it's very toxic to plants and microbes, as we mentioned. Um, really, the way it kills things is it um, interferes with an enzyme that, it, that uh, is used to uh, to actually produce uh, basic proteins in a plant or a microbe. And um, that protein is not being produced. So essentially, the plant or the microbe actually starves to death. It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. 
Uh, I would love to test everybody's urine in this room because in America, about 86% of people, any group of people, have concentrations of glyphosate in their urine. That means it's coming in. It means it's going out. My concern is, what's it doing when it's in there? And that's where the research isn't happening. And it's toxic to beneficial soil, soil organisms, and we'll be talking more about that as well. So we hear about glyphosate as an herbicide, but it's much more than just an herbicide. In 1964, uh, it was patented as a metal chelator. It was used to clean pipes and boilers, scale inside a pipe, like you might have calcium forming inside the pipe, cutting down the size of the lumen, the opening inside that pipe. And what uh, industrial operations do is they put glyphosate in there, and chelators actually will, will grab onto that calcium and chemically bond with it. So a chelator is something that bonds with a chemical and holds it tight and forms some kind of a stable uh, complex. In 74, it was uh, patented as an herbicide. And in 2003, it was patented by Monsanto as an antimicrobial um, substance that kills bacteria. So even though we've been told for many years that it's pretty benign, it's actually very toxic, especially uh, glyphosate-based herbicides. Herbicides like Roundup. Roundup just isn't glyphosate. Roundup is a uh, combination of adjuvants uh, that are proprietary information. They're kept secret, confidential. And the declared active ingredient is glyphosate and Roundup. And usually, when the EPA tests this for toxicity, they're really only testing the glyphosate. They're not testing the combination of things. The synergistic effect that happens uh, with uh, a glyphosate-based formulation. When it breaks down, it breaks down into something called AMPA, amino methyl phosphonic acid. This is also very toxic. So the additives to Roundup actually make it more toxic than just the glyphosate alone. And this is a well-kept secret. The research is out there. Uh, you can find you know, the data on all of this. But Roundup is actually more toxic. And not only Roundup, but the other uh, uh, glyphosate-based herbicides that are on the market. There's a lot of them now. It's not just Roundup anymore. I think the patent for that went out I don't know, around 2000, 2002, or something like that. So other companies are now producing these glyphosate-based uh, herbicides. So let's talk about a chelating agent. 64, we talked about that, there's the patent numbers. Um, it, it binds with metals, calcium, magnesium, manganese, iron, it binds with all of these. So when you spray it on any soil, it's going to bind with those particular uh, uh, metals and make those metals unavailable to the plants. It's actually going to degrade the soil. And that's what's happening now. Any, any time glyphosate is used someplace, it's going to be absorbed by the plant that you want to kill. But what now touches the soil, it's going to take and bind with those metals in the soil, calcium, magnesium, manganese, and iron, and make those substances unavailable to a plant. So it actually degrades um, the soil that plants are living in. And invasives can do pretty well in degraded soils. Take a look at its uh, antimicrobial substances, uh, 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 characteristics. <clears throat> Bacteria 
in the soil is really the cornerstone of healthy soils. Without a good, rich uh, bacterial ecosystem going on in that soil, you're not going to have a healthy soil. And once again, not only does glyphosate uh, grab on to the metals and not make those nutrients, those minerals available to a growing plant there, but now we have uh, glyphosate actually killing or inhibiting the uh, bacterial populations in the soil. We talked about the soil microbiome. There's a lot of talk now about the gut microbiome in humans, but the soil has a microbiome as well. And you've probably heard that a tablespoon of good, rich soil contains as many bacteria as people on this planet. They usually use those kind of analogies. There's a tremendous population of bacteria in a good, healthy soil. So this degraded soil really leads to the establishment of invasive plants that we're basically talking about tonight. <clears throat> Is glyphosate biodegradable? Early containers had the word biodegradable right on them. Um, I look for the word biodegradable in certain things. Um, and I like to see that because it tells me that whatever product I'm using, usually a cleaning agent, that it's going to degrade uh, down into something that's not harmful. Monsanto claimed this for years, and they had to be taken to court uh, by France and by the state of New York to get that biodegradable off that label. When you go into um, uh, nursery stores or, or farm stores, take a look at the, uh, the glyphosate jugs. You won't see the word biodegradable on them. So how does this glyphosate enter our water resources? Well, if you're spraying glyphosate on vegetation anywhere near um, a wetland resource area, a pond or a stream or a lake, river, um, you're going, to, uh, you're going to get some of that running off. It's not all going to be absorbed by the plants you're trying to kill. Spray drift, any kind of wind is going to take and, and uh, move that spray away from the target plants. And it might wind up with non-target plants or it might wind up on the soil. And of course erosion can move that into a wetland resource area or wind generated. Remember back when we had that long list, it said that uh, glyphosate adheres to soil particles? So if it adheres to soil particles, uh, erosion is a big factor in moving uh, glyphosate from an upland area that's been sprayed to a wetland area. You can have intentional or unintentional oversprays. I used to be the conservation administrator for the city of Pittsfield back in the 1980s. I was the first administrator that they had. I was uh, asked to look at a wetland uh, on the uh, Lennox Pittsfield line. I got out there, all of the vegetation was dead. All dead. The person who uh, actually got turned in took and sprayed the whole wetland with glyphosate killed everything there, and thought that I couldn't identify a dead, dried up plant. Of course, you can do that. So you can intentionally overspray, or unintentionally, it could be accidental. Also, root decomposition. Remember I said that this is systemic? So when you spray a plant, it's taken in. The glyphosate, along with the other formulations and Roundup, is taken in to the uh, to the, the vascular system of the plant. And it's transported around the plant via the vascular system. That's how it can get down and kill the root systems or impede the root system's growth. But once it's down there and the plant is somewhat dead, that root's going to decompose. And that glyphosate or its metabolite, AMPA, is going to be 
in the soil in a deeper profile. So root decomposition is a way that uh, glyphosate gets deeper into the soil. a bar graph from the USGS. They've done a lot of nice work with glyphosate. Uh, for some reason they've recently stopped. I don't know what uh, that implies, but let's take a look at the um, you know the bar graph in general. You see glyphosate in the blue and, and the AMPA uh, in the, um, the green. Groundwater it gets into groundwater, but because it adheres to soil particles, it doesn't easily get into groundwater. WWTP stands for Wastewater Treatment Plant. When Great Barrington's Wastewater Treatment Plant discharges their wastewater, I would expect them to have high levels of AMPA in that water. A little bit of glyphosate that hasn't broken down in that whole uh, decomposition process that takes place in wastewater treatment plants. Lakes and ponds. Glyphosate doesn't readily break down in water. It takes quite a while for that to happen. That includes, you know, ponds, <coughs> lakes, and wetlands. Soil water, streams, larger rivers. Now you have, um, the major uh, rivers, besides the Housatonic, is the Green River. And when I did a lot of consulting 20 years ago in Great Barrington, uh, at that time there was something called induction wells <clears throat> along the river. Are you guys familiar with those induction wells? An induction well is, we've got the river here, we've got a sand, a sandy area, and a well over here. As the water is pumped out of that well, it induces water from the Green River through the sand filter system, which is pretty natural, into the well again. Uh, I don't know if those are active anymore, but if they were, it would be very interesting to test the uh, concentrations of glyphosate in that water because that's, a, that's the kind of place that you could wind up with um, mostly agriculture, mm -hmm. landscaping, homeowners. Homeowners use a lot of glyphosate. Uh, up that watershed, we could wind up with a lot of glyphosate coming down the Green River. And it'd be very interesting to, uh, to test all of that to see what kind of uh, uh, levels of glyphosate are in that watershed. Look at precipitation. I wouldn't expect us to have high levels of glyphosate and precipitation. Mostly this data came from the, um, the Mississippi watershed, where in that whole watershed there's a lot of glyphosate used. Uh, we don't use a lot in the Berkshires, uh, not compared to uh, the Midwest and West and the South. Ditches and drains and soil sediment. But you can see this. This is the detection frequency in percentages. Uh, you know, uh, like, like 80, for instance, that's the percentage of, of tests that contained a certain, uh, certain levels of glyphosate or the metabolite of glyphosate. This is good data. Take a look at Google USGS glyphosate. They have other good reports out there uh, that they talk about levels of glyphosate that they found in regions of the United States. You know, let's get back to talking about the Green River again. You know, a homeowner uses a little bit here, farmer uses a little bit here, another homeowner over here, landscaper here, it becomes cumulative. If it washes out into the Green River, you could have a level of, of glyphosate in that, in that water. 
and I'm not sure whether it's used. Maybe somebody can help me. Is that is yes, that, that is induction the, wells being used? That today? is the town water supply still. That is the town water supply still. I'm in Aqua. Oh, well, I'll tell you, we, we ought to be checking for life a then, because that's a, um, a pretty big watershed. The Green River, I, I was raised uh, uh, in New York State, and we used to go to Austin's. Austin's in New York is, is some of the headwaters of, of the Green River. So it's a it's a big watershed. It's out it's out of the state. It's out of Massachusetts. Yeah. So um, it might be something you want to uh, check in on. But also uh, Lake uh, Mansfield, is that it? Lake Mansfield. Yeah. I'm told that that's a tertiary uh, water supply for this city. Not um, an emergency. Not anymore. Yeah. Not true. Yeah. Okay. It was uh, years ago. They had plans <coughs> for it. If they ever needed uh, water for some reason, uh, and they couldn't get it to the primary or secondary, they would go to uh, Lake Mansfield as a tertiary source of water supply. And once again, this is old information, so I'm glad you're updating me on it. So we talked a little about how to degrade soil it will break down by microorganisms, uh, mostly. Also, temperature is a, big, is a big factor. So in colder temperatures, it just doesn't break down. Here's some of the half pipes. You'll never, you'll never see anything where Monsanto will say it'll last, it'll hang around for 300 to up to 420 days. This is independent research. This isn't corporate research. I'm giving up on a lot of corporate research. The big problem with it is just too much money involved. Roundup is a multi-billion dollar profit for Monsanto and now Bayer because they own it. But you've heard about the court cases out in California. There's been three court cases where uh, people have said that um, like to say Roundup has caused a non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And one of the cases uh, wound up with a $2 billion, um, what do they call that? Judgment. Judgment. $2 billion judgment for the people who wound up with the non-Hodgkin lymphoma. Today, there are over 40,000 Cases pending. People who will want to sue Monsanto for giving them non Hodgkin's lymphoma. So it's turning out to be a big deal. Um, places like Home Depot and Lowe's are being sued for selling it. So a lot's going to shake out with this substance probably this winter. Of course, Monsanto is really slowing these court cases down. Uh, which you can easily do uh, by requesting more information. But uh, a lot of this is going to shake out. We're going to take a hard look at this substance uh, within the next year, year and a half. Last Tuesday, I testified at a hearing in Boston, and one of the bills that I testified on was a bill to ban glyphosate in the state of Massachusetts. There were several bills. Uh, another one that I testified on would, was a bill that would allow communities to determine what pesticides they want to allow in their community. Today, you have no say. The state controls all of that. The home rule issue is out the window. And we need to bring that back. In 1992, that all changed. Before 1992, we as communities could say, well, wait a minute. Uh, I'm reading a lot of bad research on this chemical. Maybe we ought to have a moratorium on it. Maybe we ought to ban it. I don't know. But um, at any rate, um, these are bills that are before the um, before the, uh, the Joint House Committee on Environment, Natural Resources, and Agriculture. And we had a, a huge turnout in Boston. Uh, lots of testifiers, both scientists as well as homeowners, landscapers. Uh, farmers. Uh, it was a, a really a, a very enlightening 
um, uh, testimony by a wide variety of, of professions that really would want to ban this, this substance in the state. So here's some of the things that glyphosate is toxic to as far as soils are concerned. And we're concerned about soils because degraded soils uh, allow invasives to grow uh, in, those, in those soils. As a matter of fact, <coughs> invasives like a lot of um, uh, degraded soil in general. But there's some of the organisms, mycorrhizae, these are the uh, fungi that are associated with roots of plants. Earthworms, we know how critical they are. Um, frogs and tadpoles. I don't know about other amphibians. I couldn't find any good research on that. It needs to be a lot more research done. Here's the problem with doing research. Who's paying for it? <clears throat> Universities today do very little research on these things because they don't have the money. Where are they getting the money from? Corporations. The last time I looked, which was several years ago now, um, Monsanto was giving the University of Massachusetts about a half a million dollars a year. Now that's not a lot of money uh, for a school that big with that size budget. But that money wasn't earmarked for the English department. That money was earmarked for uh, research dealing with agriculture. So there's this connection with universities today. Uh, it's very difficult to get uh, any kind of money from anywhere to do independent research. And it's a real problem with knowing what to believe, what to trust, and, and, and what to do as a result. It really is a uh, problem. And you know, when I was, a, when I was in uh, university, it was cut and dry. If somebody did research and you didn't agree with it, you didn't uh, defame that person. You didn't write articles about how bad they are as people. If you've been watching these hearings on, uh, on television, what they want to do is tell everybody that that guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about. Well. That's what happens in science today. If you publish research that the biotech industry or agrochemical companies don't like, they don't go out and do their own research to prove you're wrong. What they do is write articles on how poor science you are and how this is junk science. You know, when I was in school, if somebody came out with research that a corporation didn't like or a business didn't like, they did their own research to prove them wrong. That doesn't happen today. If you do research that shows the negative side of glyphosate, as soon as you publish it, you get a duck, because they're coming at you. And Monsanto, for instance, has whole divisions that do nothing but uh, get on the computer and, and uh, you know talk about uh, Twitter and emailing and blogs and all kinds of education to people like us that say that all of this research is nonsense, this is safe. This multi-billion dollar product for them is totally safe. Glyphosate is also a fertilizing agent. There's the molecular structure of it. We are having big problems with algae blooms. Lake Erie, um, the Gulf of Gulf Coast of Mexico, Gulf of, uh, Gulf of Mexico is what I'm trying to say. Lake Champlain, I had a sailboat on Lake Champlain uh, the last um, four seasons. I didn't see anybody swimming in that lake, sailing it for four summers. I didn't go in that lake swimming. Talking about invasives, there's a crab now that's moving into Lake Champlain. It's called the Chinese mitten crab. I wonder where that's from. <laughs> it's called the Chinese mitten uh, crab because it's got a big claw 
That was my commitment. But the, um, you know, the, the invasives, the algae that are in there, the blooms are incredible. It's a fertilizing agent. Those farms in the watershed of Lake Champlain, they pour that um, runoff in there and it breaks down and the nitrogen, mostly the phosphorus, but some of the nitrogen they say can be used by uh, algae to produce these trans blooms as well. Same thing could happen in the watershed of the Green River, of the Housatonic River. <coughs> So I've been rethinking invasive plants. And if you have a situation where you think you want to get rid of an invasive plant, take a look at it case by case. Um, are these invasives part of nature? Are they actually having some role that they're playing? Are they um, supporting a bank of a stream? Are they holding? Um, are they providing some kind of cover <coughs> habitat? Maybe not food, but cover. I'm concerned about habitat destruction from invasives as well. I have a long history of it. I'm going to show you some of my history in a minute. Uh, so you want to know what role this, uh, this invasive is playing. To eradicate invasives, I'll tell you, you can forget it. Eradication is not going to happen. You want to be able to manage. You want to contain it to a small area. I think that's really good goals. We don't want it to get, we don't want to overwhelm a particular situation. But eradication, if anybody thinks they're going to eradicate the invasives we have in this country, uh, they're not taking a look at a realistic uh, view of this whole thing. Nature does well when we leave it alone. Just because we can, we can, we can spray a lot of glyphosate around this community and kill a lot of invasive plants. But just because we can, should we? I mean, maybe the cure is going to be worse than the disease. And that's what you have to look at. Uh, when you look at the case by case, these are some of the questions you want to ask, in my opinion now. Now, there's probably other questions you could ask. Uh, maybe people who are pro-glyphosate and pro-chemical um, control of uh, invasives might have other questions. But these are some of the questions that, that I would ask uh, if I was wanting to control a certain invasive in a, in, in a community. So when you think the only tool you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And some companies can't do anything but spray glyphosate. That's the hammer. But there are other possibilities. There's some of them there. Vigilance, the best way to stop invasives is to prevent them. Prevention. But you have to be vigilant. When you see the, the patch of Phragmites coming up, do something about it when it is um, in a small quantity. Don't wait for that to get big and acres and acres of Phragmites, because then, then you've got a big problem. But uh, heavy mulching, and when I say heavy mulching, I'm a proponent of things like um, Japanese knotweed. Cut it down. Metal roofing. Wood chips to hide the metal roofing. Heavy. Those are powerful plants. And it takes more than one season. I don't know this for a fact. Maybe some of you can help me. But I, when I'm hiking back in the woods, I come across the cellar hole. I oftentimes see Japanese knotweed with it. I think it was a survival tool. It comes up early, those little shoots that come up. Can anybody help me with that? Anybody know that for a fact? Okay. Disregard that comment. No, could you ask the question again? Okay. But it's, it seems like a lot of old homesteads had it planted near. Oh yeah, it was brought, up, brought here as a, as a speculative plant. At least it was brought as this to Europe, I'm not for sure. No, I don't have problems here now, sorry. It was brought here as an ornamental oh, plant. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's why it would be around the homestead. A lot of a lot of our invasives were ornamental plants. So we have hand weeding, tough. 
you need to have a crew, you need to have a crew get out there and, and really work on this. And one of the problems with hand weeding is people think once they've gone through and weeded that they're done. But you've got to go back. You have to go back uh, multiple times to really get this. We have, um, we have things like garlic mustard coming in Plainfield where I live. And people are out there uh, pulling up that garlic mustard, getting the roots up. I had about five plants come in on some soil. And that's, this is the way a lot of uh, <coughs> Uh, invasives <coughs> move around. They come, they're transported in soil, fill material. And I had some come in with fill material, and I had about five plants. This was maybe five years ago. I pulled them up, made sure I had the roots, made sure none of the seeds were, uh, they weren't, uh, they didn't have seeds at that point, burned them up, and have not seen garlic mustard in my house. Now, if I would have ignored those and hoped that they went away, I'd have fields of them now. So there's some flame weeding, steam weeding, vinegar-based herbicides. You can go to uh, wards down here and see uh, a wide variety of vinegar-based herbicides. Uh, other organic herbicides, girdling. We all know what girdling is, where we take, uh, this is for trees and shrubs, where you actually cut three or four bands around the tree or shrub and prevent movement of uh, nutrients and food sources. Uh, up and down the, um, the tree or the shrub, so it actually kills the roots. The leaves up here in the summer make food for the root systems, and if you can't transport it down there, those roots die and the whole plant dies. Now this is labor intensive. Goats. Goats do a great job. You know, they're kind of fun if you have a, like a park or something that's got Let's say Japanese um, knotweed in it, for instance. Having some goats in there would be great. Be fun for everybody to watch. If you just fence them in, you gotta have good fences for goats. Mm -hmm. They don't like to be stay in one place. They're quite the critters. I raised goats for years, and uh, they're very interesting animals. I like the precautionary principle. Right now in this country, you have to prove it's not safe. We are all part of an experiment. Food that we're eating now contains very high levels of glyphosate. Cheerios, for instance. Cheerios has over a thousand parts per billion of glyphosate pretty regularly in their testing. So if you're a Cheerios eater, you're eating a lot of glyphosate. I like to prove that it is safe before it's put out on the market. We're a long ways away from that in this country. To prove it is safe is the way they do it in the European Union. To prove that it is, is not safe is the way we do it in America. And uh, I get very annoyed when I give talks on the amount of glyphosate in food when I hold up the Cheerios box, turn it around, and there's a child there holding the little Cheerios. Because many of us gave Cheerios to our children as the first finger foods. Uh, you don't have to worry about choking, they dissolve, they're nice for kids to hold. They're marketing this glyphosate-ridden product to children. And not thinking in terms of developing brains and developing bodies. So, I've been thinking and working on invasives for 65 years. I was 10 years old when I became aware of invasives. My father uh, in New York State used to transport trees around the state. He would dig trees in, um, in certain areas and bring them to more rural areas and sell these to nurseries in those areas. And in those days, my job was to crawl around in a truckload of trees looking for gypsy moth egg cases. We didn't even slow the gypsy moths down, much less anything else. Um, but for 65 years, I've been thinking about invasives and what to do about them. Uh, 
I'm, I'm into containment. Keeping them small, preventing spreading. It might take uh, going out there when they're flowering and making sure you cut all the flower heads off or mow it during that time just before they actually form seeds. I'd like to see us spend more resources creating favorable habitat and not spend so much trying to uh, eliminate the invasive habitats that are already out there. Mm -hmm. I want to see them contained. Don't get me wrong, I don't want them to take over. I'm very concerned about, um, about habitat loss as well. But the last statement here says a lot. I think after 65 years, I'm ready to wave the white flag. Let me tell you about some of the invasives that I have on my farm. Right now, I have um, an insect in my blueberries. These are commercial blueberries called the spotted wing Drosophila. Drosophila are fruit flies. Most Drosophila like to uh, lay their eggs and breed and reproduce in rotted fruit. If you have a compost jar or a compost outside, you've seen Drosophila, those little tiny flies that are flying around. Uh, inside the house, I just vacuum them up. Outside the house, I let them be. But this spotted wing Drosophila doesn't like rotted fruit. It likes fresh, healthy fruit to lay its eggs. So it's cut into my commercial uh, berry operation considerably. Now, how come I have this, this creature all of a sudden? Well, it's a gift from the People's Republic of China. Nobody's inspecting all of those containers that come in from China to the West Coast. It's taken years for it to, to get from LA, West Coast, to the Berkshires, but it's here now. And some of you might have, you have your own little home blueberry patches or something. If you haven't seen them, you will. They not only like blueberries, but they like strawberries and raspberries and lots of fresh fruits. But that's just one example. We are a mobile species, and when we move, we move lots of things with us. Let's, Bobby, thanks. Let's Actually, I was really good. Got him in, too. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Great, great. Thank you so much. Ed, thank you. Let's start with the commission. Any questions? <laughs>